It's amazing how wonderful he can make a piano sound, isn't it? Thank you, Dr. Bull, for all your flexibility today. So the writer and amazing human being, Anne Lamott, wrote in an op-ed piece this week that many of her elderly friends have what she calls the chime. She says the chime is a vibrating energy that certain artistic and spiritual people exude, as do people with a basic spirit of generosity. Almost silent, the chime rings like a tiny triangle off in the expanse. The chime is life and is in all of us, she claims, but says it tends to be muffled until much of the clamor and the hustle of our existence quiets down. As always, Anne Lamont gives me something to consider. I don't know about you, but I think I have spent a great deal of time in the midst of the clamor and the hustle of my life. Today was a prime example. And I am realizing it has not left enough room, enough space for me to hear the chime of my life. All throughout this summer, we are searching together in order to find the sacred pathways that will help us create lives of meaning. We're using sacred texts, life-giving liturgy, music that opens our hearts, messages that speak to the deepest part of our being, and art that silently conveys worlds we can only imagine. So often in life, most of us have very little time for reflection. We may find ways to grab it a moment or two here or there, but try as we may, we know we need help in finding those sacred pathways. This is why the invitation to gather together each and every Sunday morning is so vital for our lives. When we gather together individually and collectively, we are taking the desires for our lives of meaning and moving them into intentions. Intentions that clarify for us the opportunities for growth that are just here waiting. And if you are like me, you need some help in knowing how to look and find that deeper meaning that exists in each one of us. Over these past few years, I have come to believe the search for a life of meaning is the undercurrent, which flows within us and around us as individuals and as societies. If we are actively seeking life, if we are searching for those things that bring life and are life-giving, not only to us, but to everyone, then our future can lead us from fear to hope. Think for a few moments of times in your life when you have felt the most hopeful. These moments might have happened when you were with people you love. Perhaps these moments came when you thought all was lost and then you received good news. Maybe it was when you thought a, pro a problem was intractable and then you worked to change the trajectory of a time and place and you found yourself feeling that life-giving flow growing inside and outside of you. We have to learn to stop and lean into that flow because this is the flow of interconnectedness that will literally save our lives. 
It is the flow of interconnectedness that will help us find our purpose for living. The ancient people of all wisdom traditions knew about this flow. We can see this flow so clearly in the life of Jesus. The stories of the Gospels are filled with all the ways Jesus worked to open up the sacred pathways for everyone he encountered. In his short life, Jesus let that interconnectedness flow through him. And to be clear, it wasn't a flow that stopped with his death. It was a flow that has always been and always will be available to us. And from that flow came the desire that was central in the life of Jesus. Yet in order to see and come to know this flow in Jesus, we have to take off some filters of embedded theology. Embedded theology is that which is deep within us, what we heard from childhood, what we were told over and over again. And it stays embedded until, until we start taking it apart. A lot of these filters have been used to portray Jesus in ways that link him to power and exclusion rather than humbleness and inclusion. Some of these filters have made Jesus into the morality police rather than the person who lived his entire life wanting to let people know how very much they were loved. When we can get rid of these filters, we can begin to hear the chime of life, of his life and of our life. When we take off those filters that have accumulated through the centuries, we come to realize that Jesus was never fighting for power. Rather, Jesus was always giving everything he had for love. The purpose of the life of Jesus was to bring the good news of God's love for all people. And he spent every second of his time on earth practicing that purpose as he lived and moved and had his being in the flow of interconnectedness. As human beings, we have misplaced our God-given ability to tap into this flow, and yet it is still around us. The natural world, the plants and the animals, the soil, the rocks, the water, and the air understand this flow. It is innate in their nature, just as it is in ours. Through the rhythms of life, everything is speaking a language that leads to this flow of life. This flow is obvious to very young children, yet we often miss it. And we fail as adults to remember that it was present in us when we were young. I feel certain I only remember knowing the flow because of the stories my mother told me. Stories of me playing outside all alone in the middle of my mother's garden, doing the things I loved best as I listened to the horses in the pastures and the wind in the trees, and as I talked out loud to the God I already knew. My mother would come out and ask, Sweetie, who are you talking to? And my answer was always the same. God, Mama, who else? And then she would give me a big hug and say, I love you, sweet girl. That is where I came to know the flow. All the best stories of the wisdom scriptures are about people listening. Sometimes they're lost in the desert. Sometimes they find themselves in a den of lions. Sometimes they're running for their very lives. And then sometimes, sometimes they are sitting at the feet of one who is restoring their ability to hear the chime. I wonder what it would be like for us 
to begin to listen for the chime. Anne Lamont hears it, she says, most often these days in the elderly. The elderly whose days are quieter, who gladly ruminate and gaze out windows a lot. They may appear frail, but there is strength in this fragility. And she cautions, do not mess with the very old and their cronies. While many elderly could not have children or chose not to have children, do not listen to the current rhetoric that questions how much their lives and votes at the ballot box are worth. These people create loving collectives of friends, and these friends have become their families, and they continue to create lives of meaning, lives that make an incredible difference in the world and in our lives. Every election cycle in one of Lamont's collectives is a group of postcard writers. Especially now, you will find them addressing postcards to inconsistent voters. And if you're one of those, you may get them. One of her beloved friends in this collective who spent his life as an Episcopal priest and wrote the most postcards of all and bought the most rolls of stamps to give away to everybody told her before he died, I want the world to know, as Al Capone said, we mean business. Even as his body wore out more every day, his chime, Lamont said, could and still can be heard. And Lamont at 70 says these people are who she wants to be in 10 years, if she is alive and she can remember this one thing. She paints a beautiful canvas of these friends as she writes. I see them living with grace and sometimes cranky humor, along with infirmity, pain, wobbly brains, and the scar tissue of decades enduring the blows and losses splattered throughout human life. She says they laugh gently at her when they hear once again her in her do or die mode. They laugh because they have seen over and over that most things will be okay as long as we are tender with each other. On this day, I hope we can stop in the sweetness and goodness of this place we all call home and begin to hear the chimes of life as we learn to listen for our own. <laughs>